You know, I'm uh, an old uh, sort of, you know, lapsed communist from West Bengal. So I supposedly support strikes, right? My age, Bengalis, always support strikes. But on the other hand, I must say, Air France really screwed me today. But I'm incredibly happy to be here. And it is, in fact, an honor for me because this younger generation of writers, I mean, they're like, you know, the real thing. And I'm only an academic. I will let them speak, but I should say something by way of, uh, how long do we go, in fact? How long is our session? An hour. An hour. Okay, very good, an hour. Very good, 90 minutes. Good, so uh, what I'll uh, say is that, you know, in the 80s, my brother and friend, Homi Bhava, said to me in Britain, uh, India is the uncanny. And I'm not a nationalist, so, you know, Freud's concept, the unheimlich. Unfortunately, in French, that thing has been translated as an étrange inquiétude, and I think that just doesn't work. So I'll go with the, in, the, the German and the French, the uncanny, where the familiar becomes completely unfamiliar, like looking at your face in a, in a glass and suddenly thinking it's somebody else, right? And that's, uh, and I thought Homie was just being, you know, uh, his own self. But today I feel it, because one of the most wonderful things about, and I vote in India, I'm an Indian, although I'm also at um, Columbia University, I'm a New Yorker as well. But uh, the, the th thing about India that is really wonderful is its multilinguality. And in spite of the fact that, you know, I come in from Bangladesh, which is another country, but my mother tongue is spoken by 99% of people there. And I heave a sigh of relief coming into, into India because I, there are some fellow Indians whom I do not understand. I hope you understand this as a genuine feeling of uncanniness. And today I'm in that situation because although there is a Bengali here, she writes in French. And I only ever heard good Hindi in 1971 after 10 years in the United States because I'm too old. I'm older than a midnight child, right? So therefore, you know, this, although it's my national language, I can kind of speak it, I can kind of write it, I can kind of read it, but that's about it. I was telling Ani that she knows Hindi better than I do. Uh, this is the way India is. So in fact, I'm sitting here with my fellow Indians, well-known writers whose work I knew from before, but there isn't anybody here who has written in my mother tongue. I'm a translator from Bengali. It's not like I don't know Bengali, but I'm sitting here welcoming an Indian uh, tradition, which is this multilinguality, and I think it's appropriate that the topic is the politics of language, the politics of language in India. I want to begin now, I want to begin with Salma, because uh, to an extent, Salma, you're a Tamil speaker, right? Yes. So in fact, neither of us is. I'm sorry to go on in this way, but if it is about language and politics in India, you've got to get this sense. I mean, we feel a great deal of sympathy for the work we are doing, there are outsiders who say that the only Indian literature is material that's written in English. Uh, Salman Rushdie has said that Indian literature written in the vernaculars is parochial. Yeah. Our friend uh, Fred Jamieson said that the only thing, I just took a position against it, the only, this is real politics, the only thing that these kinds of literatures can produce is allegory of nationalism, None of our writers today, and I'll, I don't want to talk too much, as they speak, you'll see that there's, that was just a fixed moment and Fred was, re, re, Fred was not reading Indian literature. At any rate, so within this context, Salma and I, in fact, neither of us, to use an Indian expression, neither of us is from the Hindi belt, yes? But on the other hand, we will speak in English and in Hindi because she doesn't speak my mother tongue, and I don't speak hers, although I certainly can enjoy her poetry, although I feel, Salma, 
that when I read the material translated into English, the person who, because I know a good deal about you, I know also that both you and Uday, in fact, were also in real politics, so-called, quote unquote, not just the politics of language, and I want to ask you about that. But when I read your poetry in English, beautifully translated, I feel that in fact the person who writes the poetry is a different person on the page. And if you don't mind, I will just read about eight or ten lines in Hindi, in English, your poem. And I will ask you two questions to start us off. Do you believe that in this English translation, lovely translation, it is you who is speaking, there's politics of language, and then the second question, tell us a little bit about the difference between, quote, real politics for our own groups in India and the politics of language. Okay, these are my two questions, but if you allow me, I read a short poem, fantastic poem by you in English. It's called Image. Stepped on in the dark, the cockroach was crushed to pulp. All night, an army of ants have marauded its flesh, leaving behind the carcass to show me the novel sight of myself. With wings that can no longer rise in flight and stick legs now redundant of no use. The floor is yours. Good evening. Musa. <laughs> uh, language is uh, the Tamil Miha or Palamayana or wealthy uh, the wealthy language of Din Solala. On dit que le tamoul est une langue ancienne et très riche. And uh, about the Indian language, le mecha uh, oldest, après wealthy one. C'est la langue la plus ancienne de l'Inde uh, et la plus riche. So many uh, <coughs> literature came from my language, one language. Uh, this translation, when we are going to translate a poem, it's very uh, unhappy to, <laughs> as a writer, it's unhappy. <laughs> this poem is a very powerful poem, I thought. Not only me, so many people uh, think about this poem, it's a wonderful poem. In my own language, when it's, it's written, in, written in English, uh, translated in English, uh, we are not uh, happy with this translation. That's why I don't want to say anything about this. In all literature, all Tous les écrivains sont un petit peu euh, euh, tristes d'être traduits, en fait. When a poem is written from a writer or poet, the image is very... They, we are using our own language, own feelings. But in the, when the translation came out, the politics and the feelings we cannot get, I thought. Next one, question number two. Good, good. I thank you. Thank you for, for uh, starting us off. Do you want to... Do you... Are you speaking to her in Hindi? Because I could manage Hindi. Oh, okay, very good. So, uh, I will now move, if I can, to, um, to my fellow Bengali and ask her and, uh, and uh, Gitanjali together, see, when uh, we hear that our material is about nationalism, it is about Indian problems, or as is often the case in Indian writing in English, it's about the problems of the diaspora, of being Indian and so on. When, we when I look at the books that 
I have read of yours. Vidandali, your text, the one I know that you also have written much other stuff, but this is your most famous book. See, I'm also plagued by this uh, a piece I wrote 30 years ago, which everybody has read, and nobody has read anything else. So I know your feeling. But nonetheless, but nonetheless, this book, which in fact, in French, you had to put the subtitle in femme effacée, right? But in fact, I don't think my is a femme effacée. No. In fact, the aporia of my mother, it's, a, it's mother, it's not, it, and mother is not allegorical about the nation or anything there. And she, the, the thing that I get, I'm not a real Hindi reader, but nonetheless, I kind of try to read it in Hindi. The feeling that I get is what the, the writer of the text cannot grasp is that her effacement is not effacement. And she is trying to grasp it as she's growing into the text. It's a fantastic novel, I must say, as you... Uh, try to, as the narrator tries to come to grips with herself growing up, and this my, the mother, who's not just, if I may say so, I'm a translator, I know the problems with translation. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Who's not, in fact, I mean, in order to make it clear to the French reader, something has to be said because the word my won't make sense otherwise. But to an extent, that's what I'll talk more about about translation, but I want to ask that question. So here's mother. And in terms of Shumona, this is how, and this is another uncanny thing. She's my fellow Bengali, she's writing in French. And I want to ask her the question later after this one about why in French there's a story. But this is how I think her text begins. Her text begins, listen to this. Um, this is it, right? This, this is the beginning. À la fin, en écartant la cendre. Avec un bâton, à la fin, en écartant la cendre, avec un bâton, on me mord une fleur fanée, crispée, couleur chair. On me dit que c'est le nombril de mon père. Okay? So, on the one hand, there is this peculiar aporetic figure of the mother who is effaced yet not effaced. And on the other hand, there is this novel written in French which begins with the, the, the flesh-colored ombril of the dead father. Now, this is not, these uh, novels are not open to the kinds of generalizations that have been made about novels being written in the Indian languages. So this is my question to the two of you, to speak to me a little bit about how you feel th that mother should be explained and why, in my estimation, she's not just, except in translation, an effaced woman. And you, what you think about the fact that this, not only just the dead father, but the, 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 the Nabi, the, the yes. Ombril, how you actually bring it into the French context, because to me, the novel is called Calcutta, this, it's my town, but it doesn't read like Calcutta, it's French. So I want you to talk about that. First, Peggy Candeli, you go, and then you, yeah. and then, you see I'm a teacher, so one, <laughs> two, three. So, and then, <laughs> perhaps, perfect. you'll say something about why in Pami Fasso in the translation. Is there somebody who is doing uh, Hindi? Because then I can... Yeah, in the room. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, right, I forgot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ha, okay. English is better. <laughs> English is never better. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't say that. I'm an English teacher. It's a lovely language. Mujhe ek to is tarah ke sawal mein padhna mere liye, ek lekhak ke liye, is sawal mein padhna ki aap rashtr, के बारे में लिख रही हैं जब आप माँ के बारे में लिख रही हैं वगैरह वगैरह मुझे लगता है कि इसमें मुझे कोई दिलचस्पी नहीं है और जो कह रहे हैं 
महान लोग होंगे लेकिन कहीं पे वो बहुत बड़ी चूक कर रहे हैं जब वो किसी कृति को इस तरह से डिफाइन करने की कोशिश करते हैं और हम ये भी जानते हैं कि ये महान लोग तो बिना पढ़े लिखे बोल रहे हैं ठीक तो बहुत ही मैं इसमें बहुत ज़्यादा पढ़ना ही नहीं चाहती हूँ और भले ही कोई भी कृति भले ही वो राष्ट्र के बारे में हो या किसी छोटी सी चीज़ के बारे में हो अगर अच्छी कृति है तो मैं समझती हूँ कि वो अपनी कोई सीमा लांघती है और कुछ और चीज़ें छूती है और राष्ट्र के बारे में भी जो कृति आज हमारी भाषाओं में होंगे मुझे लगता है वो साथ साथ मॉडर्न कृति भी होंगे वो आज के वक्त के हैं उनमें बहुत सी चीज़ें ऐसी आएंगी कि वो उसी में एक सीमित से दायरे की लगते हुए कोई एक अतिक्रमण कर देंगे सो दैट इज़ वन थिंग विच आई एम नॉट ओवरली बॉदर्ड अबाउट एंड आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू गेट इन टू अज बिग कंट्रोवर्सी ओवर दैट मैं भूल गई आपने और क्या पूछा सॉरी इज इट ओके और डू वॉन्ट मी टू ट्राई सम वन ट्रांसलेटिंग फ्रॉम हिंदी समन इज ट्रांसलेटिंग headphones. <laughs> is, okay, is may, it, is, maybe I can do both. <laughs> see, let me just interrupt and say, you see, this is the topic of our of our afternoon, the politics of language in India. We, I, you know, I'm in understanding her as I understand, and right at the end, I'll talk about the mother tongues of Africa, but um, coming from Africa, right? But uh, continue. Uh, no, but uh, sorry, Gayatri, just uh, remind me because you you said several things together, and I've forgotten. I mean, this one I remember that you talked about. Uh, Uh, the non-English works being seen too much as being, uh, you know, still in some kind of time warp and about um, nation and so on, which they are not. And um, you know, anybody who reads any of us will know that. But I've forgotten what else you asked. Yes, <laughs> what I was actually saying, um, Gitanjali, was that the fact that my the mother mm -hmm. is not. just effaced yeah. and that you are trying not you but the narrator yeah. is trying to that is yeah. part of the topic as to how we thought thoughts and then mm -hmm. we thought about the thoughts and all that stuff mm -hmm. this uh, i wanted just to share that uh, i wanted you to share that yeah. with uh, the audience okay and in that context um, i also remember now that i recall that you just said that my is the work everybody knows me by that I, that's actually not true it's only the anglo um, uh, what feel anglo anglo the english world speaking public yes It's only they who know one work and haven't really tried to go beyond now there's something there there's some politics there we have to talk about why they're not terribly interested in Tell translated works you work you don't have to keep yourself confined no, to that no, that's that's okay but i'm saying um, i have written many other things which are talked about which are uh, discussed in my um, maybe not so powerful <coughs> vibrant world of hindi mm. and uh, my is my first novel and it's the english reading public which is more or less you know doesn't know anything else uh, and that's not my fault <laughs> yeah it's the politics we are talking about but uh, as far as this uh, character you know goes and i am um, really privileged to be sitting next to my excellent um, translator and um, professor of hindi literature and uh, linguistics ani monto she's uh, translated my novel and she'll be able to explain this really really much much better because it's horrible for a writer to have to analyze and explain the character except that i think um, intuitively and emotionally i was not interested in um, a monolithic character i was certainly building a character who is not to be seen so simply in a very common stereotype people have of the indian woman particularly of a generation above me and before me and i think uh, very very slowly i wanted to as the novel unfolds i wanted to just break that stereotype and uh, basically put a question to this uh, kind of simplification where somebody who is silent or bent i mean the novel begins with a uh, with a line which is uh, 
translated into English, it is, um, it, it, the, the narrators in the novel are um, the children, the boy and the girl, and as the novel progresses, it becomes more and more the girl who's growing up. So there's a difference between the girl child and the narrator who is an adult and looking back. But there's a back and forth which goes on and they talk about the mother. And it start, the first line is, hum shuru se jante the ki mai ki reed ki haddi kamzor hai. Which literally translated is, uh, we knew right from the beginning that mai had a weak spine. Now this is both literal and uh, a metaphor. So she had a spine which um, became um, bent and um, uh, she developed the spine problem which a lot of women do, especially those who do bent work, uh, work bending down. But it was also a metaphor for thinking that Mai had no spine, you know, that she was always a weak woman and we children are here to rescue her and uh, bring her out into the modern world and give the woman her due and it was cracking this stereotype as well you know that this is not so simple it's not like the it's not a linear trajectory where the earlier generation is this spineless woman who is bent and uh, self-effacing and the new generation which knows exactly what to do and how to do it and it was just mixing up this entire thing and trying to see um, different negotiations at different times with a lot more respect and love than is given stereotypically so is sandarbh mein maine mai ki kamzor reed ki haddi ki baat kari thi aur bahar se kafi had tak ye lagta hai ki ek kamzor aurat ki baat ho rahi hai halanki jaisa aapne kaha wo jaise jaise novel aage badhta hai sabko pata hota hai ki us silence aur us chup rehne ke piche kaun si taakat hai jo apne ko assert bhi karti hai aur apne man mutabik chalti hai aur chalati hai <laughs> Wonderful. I will come back to both you and Salma. I, I will come back to both you and Salma about other work of yours mm -hmm. that should be read, mentioned, perhaps translated. I'm a translator, but I think it's uh, uh, not necessarily an act of uh, kindness toward the text. It's an act of kindness toward myself, mm -hmm. but it's kind of the love-hate relationship with mm. translation that I do. Yes. So we'll come back to both you and Salma right. about other work. But Shumona has remained quiet with her answer now for some time. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Gatri. It's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this program in the presence of uh, Mrs. Gayatri Chakravarti Sufivak. Bonjour. Uh, si vous me permettez, je vais m'exprimer en français. Oui, évidemment. <laughs> Bonjour, donc euh, je suis vraiment ravie d'être là, merci d'être là. Alors je me souviens de la question, donc je vais essayer d'y répondre. Alors déjà le titre m'a paru très intéressant, parce que le titre dit politique, euh, comme ça, d'accord, politique euh, et la langue, la langue, langue et, euh, la langue et la politique. Alors si on va chercher un peu de jeu de mots, ici c'est langue et la politique, language and the, uh, uh, politics, mais si on joue langue et EST, c'est-à-dire la language is the politics. Donc, il y a une possibilité là, donc euh, le titre m'en parle. Et pour moi, je pense que personnellement, déjà, choisir la langue française, c'était un acte un, très minuscule, personnel, acte politique, justement, euh, parce que venu de l'Inde, je suis née dans un pays qui n'a pas été colonisé par les Français, euh, sauf pour les et quelques autres endroits charmants, principalement c'est la littérature anglaise. Et je pense que dès l'enfance, dès l'adolescence, j'avais un besoin d'ailleurs. Rimbaud a dit la vraie vie est absente, et on a, on a fait une variation plus positive, plus optimiste, la vraie vie est ailleurs. Donc voilà, elle n'est pas absente, mais elle est ailleurs, il faut aller chercher, il faut respirer ailleurs, il y a un besoin d'ailleurs quelque part toujours. Donc dès le début, même si j'ai écrit un peu en Bengali quand j'étais enfant, adolescence, jeune femme, euh, mais après quand j'ai commencé à apprendre le français, c'était un coup de foudre. Et euh, j'ai commencé à traduire un peu les poètes bengali en français, les poètes français en bengali, les surréalistes pour surréalistes, les tout contemporains. Et à un moment donné, bah, j'ai commencé à écrire un roman vers 2002-2003, quand j'étais en France à Paris, en Bengali. Et ça n'avançait pas. Et je ne comprenais pas pourquoi ça n'avançait pas. Parce qu'au bout d'un certain temps, je me suis rendu compte que j'étais inconsciemment en train de 
penser en français et inconsciemment j'étais en train de traduire du français en bengali. Je rêvais à cette époque-là, ben, même peut-être maintenant, je voyais les chauffeurs de pousse-pousse -pousse de Calcutta, les voisins, voisines de Calcutta, qui ne connaissent pas un traitement en français, mais dans mon rêve, ils parlaient français. Donc je me suis dit, super, il y a une schizophrénie incroyable dans ma tête, il faut en profiter, allons-y. Et puis par la suite, c'est devenu comme un acte conscient, un acte politique, puisqu'on parle de politique, je me permets de, de le prononcer, euh, c'est que je ne me considère pas comme une personne particulièrement impudique, mais vous avez posé une question très juste à Salma, est-ce que c'est la même personne dans la vraie vie et, et dans le texte Effectivement, on n'est vraiment pas la même personne. On est deux, on est plusieurs, on est, on est les avatars, plusieurs avatars dans la vraie vie et dans les textes. Et donc, dans la vraie vie, ce que je suis comme, comme une femme indienne, même vivant à Paris, j'avais peut-être besoin de, de, de me recréer. Je suis renée, je pense que je suis, il y a une renaissance dans la langue française. Je suis renée une deuxième fois à Paris, dans la langue française. Et euh, tout ce que je ne saurais pas, je ne sais pas dire en Bengali, en anglais, euh, parce qu'il y a l'énorme poids de tradition qui est sur mon épaule, là, je peux dire euh, en français. Il ne s'agit pas de dire des gros mots à go, etc., mais c'est vraiment, depuis que je pense en français, je ne pense non seulement pas de la même façon, mais même pas aux mêmes choses. Vraiment, tout est façonné, c'est vraiment une deuxième personne je ne suis pas métisse de naissance, mais je pense vraiment que je suis métisse de culture. Donc, je suis quel pourcent indienne, bengali, je vois ma, ma très chère François Tcharia, donc elle est les plus bengali que moi, donc justement, je pense qu'une partie en moi, elle est peut-être encore indienne, je ne vais pas le perdre, et une autre partie, elle, elle est devenue quelque part française ou parisienne. Donc, c'est un acte conscient, euh, de vouloir écrire en français. Et maintenant, la question était très précise dans le texte. Effectivement, ça commence par le nombril, le nombril du père. Et j'ai su que vous, vous connaissez plus ou moins le rituel euh, de, de la crémation chez les hindous. Je viens d'une famille hindoue, même si mon père était athée, marxiste, donc je suis athée, marxiste, quelque part encore. Euh, donc, euh, héritage personnel, n'est-ce pas euh, donc, j'ai su par la suite que le nombril, c'est la seule partie du corps qui reste indestructible, même après la création, euh, après la crémation. L'absus bizarre, au lieu de dire crémation, j'ai dit création. Donc, ça m'a beaucoup <coughs> bouleversé déjà euh, d'assister à, à la crémation dans mon, dans mon père et dans le roman, Gaëtri, vous, vous le savez, euh, dans le roman, il s'agit d'une grande violence parce que non seulement euh, on voit son personne chérie et aimée depuis des années morte, mais aussi on arrache l'idée du corps intact. C'est dans quelques heures, on, on, au bout de trois heures, on vous apporte un tas de sang. C'était votre père, c'était mon père. Donc c'était tellement violent euh, comme acte euh, et, et j'ai commencé à aimer les cimetières. Je pense que c'est une façon plus lente d'enterrer un corps mort. C'est une façon plus lente de de, de, de s'adapter à la mort de quelqu'un, c'est plus paisible comme, comme rituel. Donc, bref, quand j'ai commencé à écrire ce roman Calcutta, il faut dire que ça précédait celui-là, à ce moment, les pauvres, qui, qui était aussi un autre type de violence. J'ai parlé de l'immigré, l'immigration mal choisie, non choisie des Indiens, Pakistanais, Bangladesh, Sri Lankais, en Inde. C'était un coup de colère, ce livre, à ce moment, les pauvres, était un tel coup de colère, et c'était vraiment une seule couleur qui était là dans ce livre, c'était le noir, euh, noir de la colère. Mm. Donc j'avais euh, besoin d'aller ailleurs, finalement d'aller vers mon, mon pays natal, vers ma racine, avec beaucoup de tendresse, beaucoup de nostalgie, et je ne pouvais pas euh, commencer à raconter cette histoire autrement tendre, ou autrement qui parle de plusieurs nuances de tendresse, que par cet acte violent qui est au début, qui est la crémation du père. Et le nombril, ça symbolise justement à la fin du chapitre, on voit quand la narratrice, qui m'en ressemble beaucoup, qui fait la tour du corps, qui, qui va apporter le feu à la bouche du père. Donc, aller, bouche, c'est la bouche, c'est le Big Bang aussi, la bouche, la bouche dont, dont on est né, dont on, est, dont on parle, qu'on utilise la toute parole, la source de toute parole et, et de, de la vie. Euh, donc, c'est fait la tour de la bouche. Donc, pour moi, c'était symbolique, ce premier euh, quelques pages, c'était vraiment la préface pour dire que voilà, ça c'est la bouche qui ouvre la parole pour aller vers vraie histoire d'après moi. Parce que vous voyez le, 
la couverture, je m'en permets, voilà, elle, est, <rire> elle en parle un petit peu. Donc, je parle de l'histoire politique de, de Bengale occidentale, euh, des années 60, 70 jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Donc, vous parlez de ces, toutes ces histoires, mêlées avec les personnages, leurs histoires, amour, non-amour, qui se croisent, qui se dispersent. Pour parler de cela, il fallait parler de la bouche euh, de, de départ, de la source de départ. Wonderful, thank you. You see, that's again that business of... Uh, the familiar becoming unfamiliar, the uh, one's own place as uncanny that I was talking about, because this fact of the indestructibility of the, of the, uh, of the umbilicus, this is part of, I mean, I saw my father die, this is part of the, of the heaviness of life, but it's not something I read in a French, the beginning of a French novel. It is a French novel. And so, you see, this business of the politics, I cannot translate my own Bengali material. I do a lot of translation from Bengali and also from French, but I cannot translate my own Bengali material and I don't want to talk about myself, I want to go to Ani to talk about the subtitle, but one thing I will say, no one else can translate it either because I write an extremely turgid and difficult Bengali. I can't translate it because it's another language and no one else translates my Bengali material because it's impossible to translate. So I'm not going to develop this because I'm not one of the people being questioned here. I'm the questioner. So, Ani, I turn to you, talk about the subtitle, and I agree with you, Efase doesn't just mean obliterated, so it's yours. Mm -hmm. uh, in French or in English? <laughs> As you like. Uh, well, well, of course I like better in my language, which is French, but <laughs> I don't want the Hindi, people, or, or even, Hindi? Even, even fewer people will how understand. About, how about Hindi? Uh, uh, even fewer people will understand because they don't have the mic. Uh -huh. So okay. it's okay for English if uh, people in the audience don't know French and don't have to sing. Um, although the title was chosen, I could say, uh, it's not my choice, it's the editor's choice, publisher, which is very true. But I won't say so because also I agreed. Uh, had I not agreed, I think the same title would have been selected. But I must confess, I agreed. Why? And I think I explained that in the blurb or the, the fourth page. Because in my, first of all, I would, uh, I would not have chosen une femme effacée, which is the article, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but simplement uh, la femme effacée, ou bien l'effacement. I, I agree, it's not very much more uh, meaningful, but in French, what I had in mind is the ambivalence. Of course, it is a very different ambivalence than the one uh, uh, vibrating in the novel, because it's only on uh, the appearance, but effacé as a passive uh, uh, e, 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 effacé e, e, as a passive participle uh, is uh, uh, visibly or, or we can recognize that it comes from a verb and this verb means wipe out. So the, the la ferme effacé is on, in a part the one which has been repeatedly wiped out and uh, again, with the result that she is bent and silent, and there is also an episode in the in the book where you see uh, uh, empty space in a painting representing this world around me and with me. So everything was uh, in that. Although she has been wiped out and she is timid, silent, and so on. Yet the, resi the immense resilience, and that I admit was not present in the title chosen because la femme effacée only means the one who has been wiped out, who is going to, be, who is wiped out every day of her life. But still, I prefer this uh, interpretation of the verb: an agent wiping her out and seeing nothing of her own self. This own self being up to the end. Uh, very silent and uh, understandable only uh, with different eyes, not the eyes of uh, intellectual analysis, 
This different self, of course, is not wiped out at all. And the intense resilience, who is in the character in the book, uh, is not explicit. I agree that the title man, made this unexplicitness of the contrastive resilience uh, even more unexplicit and invisible. But the thing is that in French, we don't have a word for male. In English, Indian English, it was okay because all the languages know more or less what it means, may, but we don't, la mer, no, uh, uh, la bonne à faire, even less. Uh, uh, la, there, there was no way to translate this very poly, highly polysemic uh, word in French, that is why we kept it like that, but it was meaning nothing in French, hence the subtitle. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see, this, uh, in fact, what Annie is talking about is, of course, of course, the politics of language as such. This is the, when you translate, and we are speaking as translators, when you translate, first of all, you can and should only translate from a language into a language the nuances of both of which you can feel and it's, it's, you're in the lingual memory of both languages. And I believe reading your translation that, of course, you are there. And so, to an extent, one translates knowing, and this is an old uh, uh, understanding of all translators, knowing that translation is impossible but necessary. This is why the, uh, when we translate, I always say, I also edit a series, uh, translation theory from the rest of the world because everybody believes that the rest of the world only produces raw material fiction. We in Europe and in the United States, we produce theory. And I think this is ridiculous. So I actually run a series of translations where theory in fact is written in non-Euro-US languages. But I say to my translators, and this is, I, th I know we share this feeling that you must discuss the problems in translation in such a way that perhaps one reader will want to learn the original. See, this is also the politics of, I met someone, really a kind of uh, general guy from the American Middle West on, uh, in, in Rhodes of all places. He is a Chinese specialist. Do you know why he's from like my generation, the hippie generation, I was never a hippie, thank God, but nonetheless, you know what I mean. Uh, but he says to me, because of course he was a hippie, he read the Tao Te Ching in many different translations, and the translations were so different that he thought he should learn Chinese. You see, he's my ideal guy, because he's not like an intellectual giant or a political genius or anything just an ordinary Midwestern guy. But he, reading translations, felt, and Chinese is not an easy language, that he should learn Chinese. This is the hope in which we translate, that someone will, in fact, a, a sentence in your uh, novel, which is, if I, excuse my uh, accent, okay? Which is, Dusre, hang on, I wrote it out for Harish. Dusre unhe aurate na pasanti. Your dada. See, she can't even understand my accent. Okay. Did I write that? Dus, yes. Unhe aurate na pasanti. Okay. Now, and after that, before, the, see, he did not like women, writing about the grandfather. Mm -hmm. Now, in that particular Hindi construction, it's a very normal construction, okay? Even, I mean, it's my national language, even I know that. Mm -hmm. But for us Bengalis, it is, I wrote Harish uh, Trivedi, I would have written Namvar Singh, but he's uh, no longer accessible to me. I wrote uh, this Hindi-speaking friend of mine. I said that what is really uncanny to us Bengalis mm -hmm. is that in that Bengali. construction, Na pasand is the subject of the sentence. <laughs> you know, not liking. See, these guys whose native language it is, they don't notice this, which is why Germans can't tolerate Heidegger, Heidegger because he destroys their native language. And I'm not going to say anything about Derrida, my friend. But, you know, the f uh, French uh, people, uh, unless they're of a certain caste, he destroyed the language. 
But for us, even such a very common sentence, unhe na pasanti, and just before that, you are writing about refrigerator, and what are you writing? Bilaiti gadget budget. Okay? Bilaiti is absolutely resonant with history. And in English, as well as in French, it comes out foreign or étranger. No, sir. Like we are not going to get into it here, but believe me, I'm getting, uh, my, my hair is rising on my arm. Bilaiti, you have to. Well. Yeah. But first of all, that. And second of all, gadget budget. Mm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not giving it really a Hindi, but that's not to be the creolity, the creolization is completely denied because both in French and in English it becomes the correct English word, mm -hmm. gadget. Right. Mm -hmm. See, this, it's just a very simple sentence. And dusre doesn't even mean secondly. Mm -hmm. Moreover, maybe, mm -hmm. because there's an adikta mm -hmm. in the sentence before. Mm -hmm. So, to an extent, the translator's instinct is that someone, if I write a good enough introduction to the translation, which is what I'm trying to do with you, and you see she's nodding, See, the, if someone does this to say in the ordinary language, you see, I'm redoing the translation of the La Grammatology now and, and changing it completely because it'll be 40 years of the translation. So to an extent, this is the hope that at least one person will want to learn the original, at least two, <laughs> and this translation will destroy itself. That's the, the impossible hope with which one goes. Mm -hmm. Now I come to my friend, Uday Prakash, and uh, we share, uh, already we have exchanged some sharing, okay? So uh, to an extent, I think I would like to dedicate our exchange to our absent friend, Dead to Sin, <coughs> Nobal Ngotadji, yes. unbelievable writer, who's you know, about six years younger than I, who's recently dead. We know him, both of us. To, to my mind, Uday, you're right, and you see when, I mean, we were talking gender, right? So what has happened in, and I really resonate with Uday a good deal, because this is where I've also been translating an earlier generation writer in the context of caste, class, and so on. And of course, he's also an experimental writer. So therefore, what I would like to ask you is your sense of how this opening, because you're not a romanticizer of the so-called Dalit, even that word is not accessible to the, P the SCSDs, the scheduled caste, scheduled, uh, scheduled tribes, 1947-49 constitution. They call themselves SCSDs below a certain line the word Dalit is not available to them. So to an extent, the, I would like you to talk a little bit about the effort of writing experimental prose, sometimes magical realist prose, sometimes comical prose about, and don't, you don't have to talk about just Mohandas, I'm an English reader, so therefore I haven't read anything other than Mohandas. I'm sorry I made that mistake with Pitanjali, but we'll come back to it. So you can talk about whatever you think we should hear about, but talk about this writing without romanticization. Because Maasweta, whom I translate, does romanticize a bit, although she's written fantastic texts. But your writing is different about these people. And finally, the difference between being in, quote, real politics and the politics of language. Go. So I want to say that I can speak English in English. क्योंकि हिंदी और अंग्रेजी दोनों मेरे लिए बराबर भाषाएं हैं क्योंकि मेरी मेरी मातृभाषा मैं कहता भी हूँ शुड आई स्पीक इन इंग्लिश माय मदर वाज भोजपुरी माय फादर यूज्ड टू स्पीक इन इन बघेली एंड द प्लेस वे वी प्लेस्ड द लिव्ड आई यूज्ड टू प्ले विद द किड्स इन ऑफ माय एज दे वे स्पीकिंग but I tell you, I started learning in Hindi, mm -hmm. Hindi khadi boli, which some of them call... Erect language. Uh, yeah, it's, it's this is a very phallic word. <laughs> Correct Hindi, <laughs> khadi boli. <laughs> so I really learned it through schools, since primary school, and I remember till eighth class, I committed howlers and blunders. 
So it was not easy. Even today I feel I am not that way um, taken as I'll, I'll talk later the way who, 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 who are coming from Banaras or Ilahabad and those kind of northern I'm going to interrupt you a minute. Yeah. You know, where I work is the border of Jharkhand and Bihu, Pajpagaranya. You know, not just <laughs> Maithili, but Pajpagaranya, which brings all of these together. Yeah. I'm with you. So, Carry on. Yeah, so, uh, Hindi, you see, is not a single, singular kind of a term. Hindi is, is uh, it has plurality. The way I use Hindi is really different than what you see in Delhi, in Banaras, in Allahabad, and religious holy places. I want academics, I mean academic institutions. So it's different. And secondly, I learned English. I had to learn it because most of the books, I, am a, I was science graduate. So I have chosen physics, botany, chemistry, zoology. And when I went to find uh, books, it was difficult to me to understand. Like I, I, I cite you a couple of examples. For liver, they had uh, this word, uh, yakrit, I think, yakrit, mm. and for liver. And in Hindi, usually we call it kaleja. Kaleja is understood by everyone. And for, for kidney, uh, it was brick. So it was very difficult word, even to me, because they were simply imported from Sanskrit. So Hindi, the dominant, the mother, or whatever the national, which is claimed to be national language, is, is Sanskritized Hindi. We call it Tatsam, Tatsam Bhasha. It is difficult, difficult for many people. And this is the reason that uh, literary Hindi books are not sold. I'm going they, to interrupt you again, because you see, he and I are so together, I think this needs a, the slightest bit of explanation, because yeah, yeah. you know, this is not an Indian crowd. So uh, the Sanskrit, of course, it's the high level, which is why I was using the word Dalit, and I was saying it's not accessible below a certain level. Sanskrit is a high level North Indian classical language. Tamil is also uh, a classical language of India, but there's a politics in not recognizing it as such. But the, uh, so uh, Sanskrit, when you Sanskritize these words, this is why I have written in published prose many a time that these so-called translations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is nonsense because the people to whom this uh, human rights is done, they cannot understand the Yakrits no, right. and the, and the what whatevers of these transla uh, translations in elite language. They creolize. You know, the illiterate will say harassment rather than whatever word the translators of the Universal Declaration, very Sanskritized, have devised for harassment. So to an extent, the, I'm, I just wanted to make this comment, and of course, because of our Islamophobia, the, our government has Sanskritized the wonderful, strong Hindustani, which right, into right. this kind of uh, Sanskrit Hindi, which is in fact, uh, the Rashtra Bhasha, you know, the, the Raj Bhasha. So, yeah. carry on. And, and the Rashtra Bhasha, I, uh, because it is said to be a Rashtra Bhasha, Rashtra is nation. And it's a kind of a nationalism which Hindi is now linked to. And I ask these questions to many, like uh, the national anthem we have, Janagana Man Adhinayak, is a very popular, very famous national anthem. It's in Bengali. It's written by Tagore. And he's the same poet who has another national anthem in Bangladesh. So Hindi doesn't have any national anthem, and he claims to be a, a national language. So this is one. And secondly, this question has been raised many a times, that is India a nation? And in our constitution, we celebrate 26 January. And it's still to be a federal state. So that federality, federality should be reflected in language and politics. And in, in case, suppose, if I bring in the reality, and in, in the note which I had sent over here to Caron, globalization, how did it come to me? There, I said our reality is vernacular. Our reality is not Hindi. Our reality is not English. It's native, it's vernacular, it's dark. And it's not shining at all. 
and it has no connections even no approach to Europe, to Western societies. Like yesterday, the last day, I had prepared thoroughly some fractions of my short stories and I was supposed to read with Jeet Tile and others. And suddenly I was said that you have to read it in your own language because you have to give the sound. You have to do, produce the sound. So I, I said to them that why that every time we attend the voices of the world, where voices are heard, uh, we are simply producing sounds. So voices are not heard, I tell you. Whatever the voices from India are heard, they are not ours. And here we are a bit different. And this I make at a point. In, in New York, I was there just two months ago, and also in Chicago. So when you deliver lectures or readings, they give a form. And there you have to sign. The guest scholar, a visiting professor, a visiting poet, or whatever. It was alien's signature. And I asked them, do we look like aliens? <laughs> Are we extraterrestrials, you know? And, and I joked it. I joked even to Karen. I told her that how come my daughter in life is French? My grandchildren, grandchildren are French. My wife did post-graduation in French. And I don't have any book in French. So how did it happen? So I'm a worker, you know, a freelancer, a radical freelancer. A freelancer. It is a labor. <coughs> like you are working in someone's field, a factory, a company. But you don't become the owner of that company. So the question is, who owns that language? This is a big question. I am working. I have got a wonderful academic records, I mean, top the universities and all, but I couldn't manage a job. The reason, because my Hindi was different and my, the facts I was bringing in my narratives, they were different. So I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm still, I, I, I wonder why I'm invited over here. So these questions, they, they come up in my mind and, and the language I, I used to write is Hindi. Hindi has many several problems. Like, like if you go to the survey of India, these are not 22, 22 languages which have been officially recognized. Actually, there are more than 214 languages and more than that. If you uh, count the Austroasiatic tribal languages, it's more than 300. Possibly. <laughs> I think 1,600 so-called dialects. And there are many languages which don't have script. They do not have a grammar. They don't have a newspaper or books. There are many, like and Mamang Dai, who comes over here along with me. Her language doesn't have any, any script. So uh, the problem is, you know, at the politics of the language, I, I, I think it's related. Hindi is now related. The, the language I, I write in, to nationalism, to, to, to insurging and dominating politics, to religion, to theology, to caste system, to everything which is obscure. And she is very right. When uh, you use mother, mother as a, as a symbol or metaphor or allegory, it doesn't remain, she doesn't remain mother. Because I have written a, a story which is translated to German and English and everywhere. The, story, the story's title is Nail Cutter. And that was about my mother. I was 10, 11 years of old when my mother was dying in cancer. And she was so, so helpless, vulnerable, so weak. And I wrote that. And when I visit, uh, you know, like Europalia. Okay, you're gonna wind up because the women- Oh, sure, 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 sure. Just in one minute. For the, it, at the gate, it was Durga with 18 hands, mother goddess of Hindu. With 18 hands, every hand was equipped with arms and the blood was dripping out of the tongue. And she is mother. And feminism in India now... That this in, is in your last sentence, because once mm -hmm. you say feminism in India and blood dripping, etc., we are on to somewhere else. I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 not, not, I'm not asking. I'm not okay. asking. Yeah, let me say what my soul is. Okay. So I'm, I'm against, I'm critical about combining mother and, the, uh, and, and language and the nation and the religion together. 
fine. It's, it's really, is. I think okay. mother is mother, so nation fine. is here. Yeah. Mother is mother, nation is nation. We yeah, understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, yeah, yeah. So, sorry? Just allow me a few seconds. Yes, but one thing I must yeah. say before that, which is, you know about the island of Réunion and Bhojpuri, don't you? Yes. Good. So I don't know if the audience knows this. You know that Bhojpuri, the thing that he was, the, his language, main language that he was mentioning as a, a kind of Chhattisgarhi, but also Bhojpuri, you mentioned Bhojpuri. Oh, okay. But Chhattisgarhi is not in Réunion, so therefore let's, let's talk about Bhojpuri for the moment. In Réunion, Bhojpuri is the kind of uh, elite language of the Indian community. Shahid Amin is completely, uh, completely, completely blown away by this. And on the island of Réunion, I think that we should also think about what happens to language under diasporas in Britain, there is a grammar of the language of Silet, not University Bengali, but Silet. So diasporas also play a role here. I shut up now and I want to ask all three of these women, and uh, Gitanjali will begin, as to what other texts of theirs we should look at and uh, that I don't know because I'm not a reader of Hindi literature, or indeed of Tamil literature. Carry on. Yeah, but before I do that, I just want to respond a little to the sorts of things Uday has been saying. Uh, I think when we're talking about, uh, just a few basics which I feel we should remember. When we're talking about language and politics, uh, we must remember that it operates differently in different contexts, and let's not mix up what happens at the level of government and official politics and direct politics where language is used for politics and what is happening, you know, the, the politics of language, which is about the relationship between different languages, you know, between English and Hindi, between Hindi and the so-called uh, dialects, its own so-called dialects, between Hindi and the other Indian languages. I think it operates differently and we must not just keep mixing them up and making yeah. some general statement. And finally, as li in literature, nobody's writing in that sarkari, that official Hindi language. That is a good thing and I want to stress that nobody is writing in that horrible Hindi which the government is trying to foist on everybody. It is a much more open-ended, porous, and uh, fed with all these um, uh, dialects and languages that Uday um, is speaking about, and it is a very, very vibrant language which is being created. Except children's textbooks, which is a sure, crime. Sure, sure. I mean, wherever, the, the, I'm, I'm talking of creative writing. Mm -hmm. you know, definitely not, and the people. People are not speaking that horrible Sarkari language. So we must not just mix up all these categories. About my own work, I mean, it's an awkward thing to do, Gayatri, to sort of say, look, please, I've written this also and that also and that also, and please look at it. I mean, um, I'd rather others did that, critics did it, and um, my readers did it, and I think I've written many, many things after Mai. Mai was my first novel, and I've um, uh, written and, uh, you know, had many adventures with literature and done very different things, but I'm not going to... I just don't know how to promote and profess my own um, writing. I think try, try me. <laughs> it'll be, surely it'll be an enriching experience. <laughs> I've enjoyed writing what I did. I think basically I'll just say that, yeah. That's enough of an answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's enough of an answer. That, I think yeah. that's what I I mean, if you're interested, just go. I mean, uh, you'll find my books um, on the net or here and there and um, just, See if you have the adventurous spirit and find out. <laughs> That's Good, it. Thank you. So, yeah. Shumana, uh, can you promote yourself or not? Uh -huh. oh. We Bengalis are good at <laughs> self-promotion. Self yes, let's, but let's after what yeah, guy, uh, Gitanjali just said, it will be, uh, you know, it will be a bit, a bit mischievous for me to promote myself. Now I'm in a bit position and a uh, different Shried. difficult position. Shried. So I, I'll try uh, to be modest, which I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, euh, en fait, euh, je vais encore euh, présenter, <rire> parler, continuer en français. Euh, bon, je pense que j'ai déjà un petit peu répondu, malgré moi. 
en parlant de Calcutta et le début euh, de la phrase que euh, Gayatri a, a prononcée, la première phrase de la bouche, le père, j'ai dit pourquoi Calcutta Parce qu'il y a eu à ce moment les pauvres qui le précédaient et le livre c'était sur l'immigration, etc. Donc je vais... Euh, fait en sorte que je ne parle pas de moi, mais finalement je parle de moi, je vais un petit peu jouer comme ça, rapidement. Euh, c'est, je pense que ce qui est en train de passer en Inde, et il y a cette imposition d'une langue royale, euh, patriarcale, étatique, je ne sais quoi encore, qu'on est essayé d'entendre d'ent- imposer, et il y a des auteurs qui résistent, qui écrivent dans la langue vernaculaire, avec leur langue libre, la langue est une liberté, le moment qu'on commence à écrire, ce n'est pas tout à fait la langue maternelle ou la langue qu'on a connue, on invente, chaque auteur invente sa propre langue finalement, donc tout cela c'est, c'est, c'est une grande aventure, malheureusement depuis 14 ans que je suis en France, je suis un petit peu éloignée, j'ai traduit certains auteurs il y a quelques années, mais c'est aujourd'hui que je découvre ce que Oudaï pense, ce que Gitanjali pense de tout cela. Et dans ma part, je peux simplement dire que je vais finalement répondre à votre première question, comme ça, ça m'aiderait à répondre à votre dernière question. C'est que comment on peut écrire un, un roman sur Calcutta, sur l'Inde Malgré cela, ça reste un texte français, en fait. C'est, c'est justement, comme je disais au départ, que je ne pense pas du tout en Bengali, je pense en français. Donc, du coup, euh, ce roman-là, Calcutta-là, ou même euh, à ce moment les pauvres, je ne saurais jamais écrire cela euh, il y a dix ans, même maintenant, en, si j'étais encore à Calcutta, je n'aurais pas écrit ce roman-là. Non seulement pas de la même façon, mais ce roman n- n- n'aurait pas existé, en mm. fait. Parce que puisque aujourd'hui, je ne suis plus en Inde, je ne suis plus à Calcutta, probablement, j'ai un besoin de, de revoir, revisiter mon pays natal d'une autre façon. Et comme je disais que c'est une métissa, un métissage culturel, donc ce roman reste à la fois le fond, il est indien, bengali, mais il y a un regard français probablement qui est imposé, qui joue là-dessus. Et euh, pour mon découvrir, c'est très facile. Euh, je viens de commencer ma vie d'auteur euh, parce que même si je, j'ai un certain âge euh, biologique, mais en littérature en française, je suis toute jeune. <rire> Donc, euh, c'est très facile de me trouver. Les livres sont là. L'aventure, elle est formidable. Je ne peux que remercier la... la les, le milieu français et littéraire pour cela en France et dans d'autres pays francophones, tout se passe euh, merveilleusement bien. C'est wonderful. En fait, ce que j'ai pensé, c'est ce que vous avez aussi dit, que en devenant un writer en français, vous avez somehow, wittingly ou unwittingly, et maintenant je vois que c'est wittingly, escapé ce whole business de la langue I Je veux dire, je travaille maintenant avec Chandanagar, donc c'est une autre chose. That's a very different there, Parashdana. That's a very different business. That was a French occupied place. But this is something that has to be thought of. And as for uh, sound, you know what you said about why do you need to hear? You see, that's how in the beginning the idea of the barbarian came. You see, the people who, the Greek word, barbaros, the people who spoke languages that they did not understand were not talking, they were just going ba 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 That's why they were barbaric, they were barbarians, because, and that's why to stammer is balbusier, ba ba ba. Now the trouble is that if you do just the opposite, I want to hear the, oh, how wonderful the sound is. You might be cursing, but it's a wonderful sound. That's legitimizing it by reversal. So, you know, it's the minus, it's the plus, where it was minus. What I would, but on the other hand, Uday, there is also a good place where what be, happens to it is that it is listened to, not the people who want to hear the sound, no. Sound might as well be noise. But it is listened to with the sense this is a language. I don't know it. It's making meaning. That's called a trace. So it's a trace of a language, like a footstep of something. So we live, if we can live in a world of languages, island of languages, in a huge ocean of traces, these are languages, but we don't know them. Then I think we don't have this strange idea of world literature. World literature, we want it, but we cannot have it because language belongs to no one. You have to really get into it, you know. The, uh, the 
the tribals in my area, the Lohars, uh, one of them sang, uh, sings a song which I have quoted a million times, Mon kare uri kare. My, my mind wants to uh, fly, Bidhi pakha. The rules of uh, the, the law of the world doesn't give me wings. That's the whole business uh, the, about, uh, about uh, wanting a world leader. Of course we want to fly. The, in fact, no wings by the law of language. So I want to come back to Salma. And Salma, the question that I want to ask you, because once again I made a mistake. I asked them to promote themselves. See, unfortunately, Bengalis are very good at self-promotion. So I was really <laughs> speaking. They're sentimental, they're liars, and they're boastful self-promoters. I was speaking like a Bengali, I'm sorry. So I will try to form it another way. What are you writing now? Tell us. First, uh, we, are, uh, we are Tamilian. We want also <laughs> promoting ourselves. <laughs> our own language. We, we are very proud about our language. Okay, and uh, in, uh, uh, India have la many languages. Indian, we we are uh, most of the people uh, speaking in Hindi, but uh, every state we have own language. But sometimes the Hindi want to dominate our people in the language in the, they want promote them the language into our state we are uh, al we are always fighting with <laughs> in the, uh, the we want to accept that kind of promotions in order writing the language and the model translation work uh, first one, then our, uh, I was 13 years old. I read a poem, uh, Mahmoud Davis poem. Uh, he wrote a uh, wonderful poem. Uh, one English poem translated three persons. Three people translated same poem. This is Mahmoud Darwish you're yes. speaking about? Yeah. Yes. I got three poems. <laughs> one poem, three meanings. Okay, the translation language is the most important thing. The writer of the expressions is the most important thing. The language is the most important thing. I got, I read a lot of um, literature, Russian literature. <laughs> Vasiki Aram Kirapo, Yenakur language on the Kadaki. Allow the Nam Enodia Tamil or language of Dina Yenaka Kadakira or Indurushi on the Allow the politics of Dina and the writing Lerko Kudia, language Lerko Kudia politics. And the Ushi on the Nakuri Aram Kiran. Upon the Nainoda writings clown the society Patina or Viva the Allow the Emerson of Dinsola. I want. Criticize my. Sino. Sí, sí, no. Why no? Why no? no. Why no? 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 Why c'est un roman qui a créé une certaine euh, stupéfaction. C'est un roman qui a créé une certaine stupéfaction. C'est un roman qui a now we have about 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you want to ask this, questions? This is my first novel. I, I broke all the silence of the Muslim women in our community. Uh, before we know the people, they don't know about uh, uh, our life, what happened Muslim 
women's life, what kind of problem they are having. Nobody knows. But af after I wrote this novel, I broke the silence. I broke the silence. Then uh, more controversial one thing also. I wrote about women's sexuality in our community. Women desire in our community. What kind of problems they are having in our community. I want to share, I want to open all the things. After I wrote this novel, I got more threatened, everything. Uh, I should not write. The people, the conservative people and religious people, they are threatening me. Still, you should not write like this. You are a Muslim woman. Uh, we should not write these kind of issues. You are lying. They said, I'm lying. No. <laughs> I, this is true. They don't want to accept that true. They want to hide all the things. They want to hide all the truth. They don't want to talk about issues. Uh, now I'm starting my second novel. It's halfway now. I want to write more about our community. What problems we are having. What we need. Yesterday I met a friend who is from uh, South Kuwait, I think, who is a Muslim. Uh, yesterday I met him here. We spoke about our community. He said, how many years we need to cross all the things? At least 250 years we need, he asked to me. I said, no, end of this world. They don't want to understand our society. They don't want to change themselves. This is the problem. We should open a debate. I, I'm opening in my writings uh, the debate. They, I want to create a space for women in, in my life, in my writings. They are always need a space. I want to, my novel is, next novel also, talk about some issues about human life in our community. That's, uh, I really do want the floor, we started slightly late, to have an opportunity to put a question or two. I think what really comes through is that Indian writers in our, these Indian languages, they are like most writers, deeply autocritical as well as assertive and affirmative. And so they, the, the refusal to be interpolated as sort of commodities uh, of wonderful others and so on and so forth, once one gets into the regional languages, there are Indian professors who, are in fact, who have a theory that if one develops the regional language uh, literature theory that becomes more Indian. I'm thinking about E.B. Ramakrishnan. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea that it's not just stuff that's written in English necessarily that can get the, uh, the adjective Indian uh, fiction, that is to say, and poetry. So I s shut up now. Let's say we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, to um, uh, entertain questions from the floor. Do you want to ask these people anything? Okay, well, uh, Uday feels that as the only man here, he has not been given the proper time. So, but, but be, be, I mean, uh, what I would like to say to you is that the rich and the poor have not been equally free to sleep under the bridges of Paris. We, I mean, for centuries we have quietly borne it when we were asked to be silent. I'm 72 years old, it's my personal experience. But so be brief, because we want to hear from the others. Go, tell, tell us what, how we shut you up. I'm not, but I don't want to become the hangover of the earlier what has been done. So no one wants to be a victim of history, you know? Mike. So that is, that is what Mike. I wanted to know. Yeah, and it's just, I'm not uh, complaining, I'm saying that uh, any individual, uh, male or female, one should not become the victim of the history of the past of the hangovers. So that's what I was saying, and, and we had been doing that. So now, but we should not be punished for that. It was not me, every writer is an individual. And I like, uh, I can quote several of poems where, where we have in our society, there are parts, 
which is a matriarchal society. So women are given such a freedom, you, you, you really, you can't imagine. Okay, so, then so this is a point. Uh, and secondly, one, one yes. point more, that, that I have wonderful translators, few of them, and they are my extension of my own self, you know. And, and like, like and, and, and they belong to other languages. Like in America, I have mm -hmm. two wonderful translators. In German, I have a, a, two translators who actually, even without having the full uh, cognitive knowledge of a culture, of a society, if he really becomes something very close to the author, he becomes almost the soul of the author. So this is one point. And that is the relationship with the, with, with the original of a translator. And I think that, that is the way to inform what is the politics in language the author belongs to. Okay. So this is what. Yeah, All right, let me just say something about being victims of history, etc. okay? But I'm a caste Hindu. I've been uh, uh, working now for 30 years with um, uh, landless illiterates in that border place. The thing is, what I say to them is, look, I'm a good person. So were my parents. They were staunch, plain living, high thinking anti-casteists. But what are two generations in the face of thousands of years of cognitive damage? I'm your enemy. If one must be able to take responsibility for history, rather than I used to say to uh, uh, people in my classes, I'm only a bourgeois white male. I said, well, good. Develop some rage against a history that will not allow you to speak. So to an extent, you know, and this is all over the place in my writings, most recently about Kutsie. What is the relationship? Mm -hmm. How much bigger is history than personal goodwill? So to an extent, the, I would say that in order to develop a historical awareness of how things go, it has to become a little more than self-claimed I mean, I hear my relatives in Calcutta talking about, you know, the caste Hindus are really getting it in the neck these days. I leave the room. I leave the room. I cannot continue this conversation. So to an extent, the, I think that is, I'm sorry, I didn't really let you ask a question, but this is a enormously important uh, idea to develop, uh, self-consciousness to develop. The idea of responsibility for history rather than keeping oneself confined into a sort of personal victimhood. This is, the, this is the, the lesson that I have learned now in 30 years so that I can say to these people again and again, try to do without me, try to do without me. I used to say this also to Mahasweta Devi, whom I translated. Mahasweta Devi, they're doing it for you, not for the people that you're working for. That's something that I think it is obligatory for us, those of us who have enjoyed a certain kind of historical, not me personally, nor my parents, it is, Im it is important to earn some kind of sense of responsibility for history, which does not become a kind of personal breast beating and does not stop you from acting. I would like to, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have any more time, do I, Sapwan? Okay, who is in charge? Oh, I always have time. Okay, then whatever the, uh, if people will allow us to take more questions, I see a hand. Not to me, to uh, the, the writers, okay. Mr. Gobalakishnan, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I just have uh, one remark and one question. Um, the remark is, uh, Gandhi said, when he returned from South Africa in 1916, I think, following the advice of uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, everybody in India should learn in North, for example, Tamil, and in South, Hindi. I think the Congress hasn't followed. The, so that's all for politics, as you said. The question is, I'm also very proud of the second remark, that one Muslim poetess in Tamil has come here and even so beautiful poems in Tamil. Thank you, Ms. Salma. The question is for, I think, for uh, Mrs. Sin Sinha, Sinha, who talks in French. Well, I would like to speak in French because I'm from Pondicherry. So, it's a great honor, how do I say, to my apprentice, and I would like to give a homage to Jules Ferry. Excuse me for the English. 
Parce que si Julie Fry n'avait pas été là, moi, je ne serais pas aujourd'hui ici. Je suis de Pondichéry, donc je connais mes antécédents, paysans, etc. Donc la question est la suivante. En général, on rigole en France, quand on voit les Belges, les Hollandais, être si sérieux dans leur pays et pas aussi sérieux en France. Parce que quand on est à l'étranger, on se donne beaucoup plus de liberté. Donc je transpose ceci à la littérature. Je voudrais savoir à vous, mademoiselle, si toutefois vous vous sentez libre, plus libre, est-ce que est-ce pour avoir une, source, une liberté débridée ou bien un peu bridée Merci. Okay, let's take two more and then we will answer because we only have five minutes. Brief, be brief. Okay, yes, yes, go ahead in front. Be brief. I'm Patrick Fandir and I'm Belgian French publisher and I'm serious even in France. Uh, someone in a preceding panel uh, with various young authors um, was asked by someone in the audience, but why do you write in English? And I was really questioned by the, the, the answer is, but English is an Indian language. So we use it like an in Indian language. Sorry, yes. So what is your point about Indian, uh, English as an Indian language? Okay. Now, one more and then that's it. Yes, go ahead. And please, briefly. My name is Ruth Genser. Uh, my question is, among bilinguals or trilinguals, a very common effect is that of code switching, mixing in different languages mm -hmm. when code you're speaking. Switching. How? Is that a common phenomenon within the Indian literature, and how do you deal with it in translations? Okay, good question. Now, you wanna, okay, you wanna stop? Good. All right. Bon, je vais commencer à répondre à, à la question de monsieur de débrider ou pas. Monsieur, il est très difficile de ne pas être débridé un peu quand on goûte un très bon Saint-Émilion. Donc, euh, la vie <rire> à la française, euh, voilà, c'est une petite dose de, de dévégandage. Mais bon, après, je ne pense pas que l'intérêt est de savoir qui je suis en personne, personne, qui je suis, vous voyez, dans ma vie quotidienne. Euh, l'intérêt de savoir ce qu'en écrit les auteurs, qu'est-ce que ça représente, euh, quel message s'il y en a, on, on essaye de passer. Et euh, là, il y a une image qui vient dans ma tête, parce qu'il y a toujours des images qui viennent dans ma tête. Je pense que la littérature, euh, n'importe quel texte littéraire, c'est baudelairien dans le sens que c'est la fleur du mal. Vous voyez la lotus, lotus, la, la racine, elle est dans la boue. Et ce qui tra traverse, dépasse l'eau, c'est la fleur, magnifique fleur. Donc, pour les auteurs, les artistes, il est possible que la racine reste dans le quotidien assez sombre ou pas sombre, peu importe, ce que vous décrivez comme sombre. Et après, ce que vous voyez, ce qui est visible, c'est les pétales, c'est les fleurs de lotus. C'est ce, qu ce qui nous intéresse, le reste, la racine, sous l'eau, on ne peut pas en parler. Now, who wants to speak to English is an Indian language? Um, I, uh, Indian, I think English definitely can be called an um, Indian language today. I mean, it has been turned on its head by the Indians and um, made into just some other language, so there's no problem with that. I think the problem lies elsewhere when other Indian languages are somehow made increasingly invisible. I think that is the problem, not that English is also an Indian language. Let it be, but it is the most powerful language at the moment. And the story doesn't end there because then there is the politics of the other languages and the relationship between them. And Annie, I don't think, has time today, but she would speak of uh, many other so-called uh, dialects, which are languages that are completely invisible in India. And when you go to the Commonwealth Literature Conferences, What, what there, very seriously, people compare are the advances paid to those who publish in English and those who publish yeah, right. in the regional languages. I don't want to bring that up at yeah. the end of a session. A there was a question about the um, uh, use code of many code switching, use of many different uh, languages inside yeah. bilingual, trilingual. Mm -hmm. What does a translator do with that? It's uh, very variable. When it comes to code switching with the English, which is the most répandu. In moyenne, it's very easy because we are not English. 
donc on garde l'anglais, c'est ce que je fais, c'est ce que les éditeurs vous conseillent. Quand il s'agit, c'est très courant aussi en indie, de code switcher entre euh, un registre très littéraire, sophistiqué, euh, de type persianisé, et puis l'autre registre qui a été commenté également, très littéraire, sophistiqué, de type sanscritisé, ce n'est pas avec les registres de langue du français qu'on va s'en sortir parce qu'il y a aussi des registres de langue en anglais, et ça, euh, c'est un défi que j'ai vu personne euh, résoudre. Il y a des ouvrages que je ne traduirai pas uniquement pour cette raison, parce que euh, l'essentiel de leur vertu, euh, de leur rasa, de leur euh, euh, flavor hein, euh, stylistique, tient à ça. Certains bouquins de K.B. Vade, euh, je pense que le traducteur, il, il connaît ses limites, euh, certains, pour d'autres raisons, ils vont hésiter à traduire des choses comme... Euh, comme euh, à laisser nous rendre dans et puis euh, quand on est dans l'univers indien, je ne connais pas la situation des autres langues, mais je pense que c'est quand même, ça doit être assez fréquent dans toutes les grandes langues littéraires avec une longue tradition écrite. Et ce n'est pas juste euh, le, 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 le code switching entre états historiques, entre dialectes, où c'est vraiment des emprunts euh, à des traditions également littéraires, également élevées, qui se rencontrent. Et euh, on n'a pas ça en français. Hein. Je serai en serbe, j'aurai ça sous la main. En français, non. Voilà. Thank you. There's so much more to be said. This is the beginning of a conversation, but we must make an end to the formal part of it. And thank you very much for being such a fine audience. Thank you.